Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk, uh, have our first lecture on, or video on um, Lebesgue integration, and specifically I'm going to go over pre-images. If you're familiar with pre-images already, you can either skip this video or skip to the end. The end I will talk about a primer basically for Lebesgue integration, and the next video will really get into um, Lebesgue integration. So that being said, pre-images are absolutely necessary. They're interesting in their own right, but they're going to be an algebraic tool that we use over and over and over again. So um, maybe review this video twice. Make sure that you really understand this uh, before moving on. Otherwise, everything will be really confusing. So I'm going to take uh, set x and y, arbitrary, and just consider a function f from x to y. Then I'm going to take a set A that's contained in the codomain of F, uh, contained in Y, which is the codomain. Then we define the preimage of F under that set A to be defined as follows. The set of all X in X such that F of X is in A. Note, this is absolutely not F inverse. I haven't told you that a is or that f is bijective. I haven't even told you that if a bijection between x and y exists. For example, if x was the reals and y was singleton zero, uh, it's clearly not a bijection. So, unless you see something that's a bijection, anytime you see this symbol, it is pre-image. Unless for, unless you're in a weird environment where you're saying f is a bijection between these two sets, yada, yada, yada. It's kind of weird notation. So uh, it's standard in pretty much every textbook. So kind of kind of have to get used to it to some degree. And eventually you will. Also, this is a set. Uh, so what does it mean to take the inverse of a set? Also kind of weird to think about. So this can help you by context to know that you're talking about the preimage. Anyways, this is partially why they do it. If you start with the set A as input, Basically, the reason why they use this inverse is because if I give you a point y and you basically work your way backwards into the domain. So I start in the codomain. So usually you start in the domain, I plug in x, and I give you something in the codomain. This is sort of the opposite. I give you a set in the codomain and you work backwards. What is all the x that mapped into that set? So because you're working backwards, that's, that's why that f inverse is there. So for example, this x is in the preimage because it maps to this point. That point is in the set A. So I throw x in this set as I start to construct it, basically. And I'll give you guys an example on the real line here that, that'll ho hopefully uh, elucidate this a bit. So let's consider f of x to be x squared, x equals y equals the reals, and my set A is going to be an open interval with the left endpoint um, greater than or equal to zero because uh, this function is never going to map below zero. You can think about what happens if A is, uh, so if A and B are both less than zero, the preimage is the empty set. Um, and then you can do different combos, but I'll just go through this one combo um, here since this is the, the most non-trivial. So the way that you can, or the way that I like to compute um, pre-images in my head, at least, is as follows. So if you're on the real line, you can literally, you know, this is directly visual, but you can think about it this way on even more abstract spaces if you like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut across my codomain. So here, my codomain is y. My domain is x. I cut across my domain y. And I say, OK, well, I know what this set A looks like if all I was considering was y. So in this case, it's an open interval aligned along the vertical axis here. So what I do is I now take that set, and I take small slices. 
So really I would color this in for a more abstract set because it's not necessarily connected like this. So really all I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna color this whole thing in and I put dashed lines because it's open. And I see, for example, is there any point that goes along this line here? Do I hit any green? If I hit green, I add that point, I take this point, I shift it down onto my domain. Because remember, we're starting in the codomain, we go down to the domain. And if that's the X that generates it, okay, well, that's in the pre-image. And I sort of uh, can generate the pre-image this way. So with an open interval, what I can do is actually just draw this sheet. And so anywhere I see green, um, I say, okay, well, that's, that's in the set, and I can sort of visually generate it in my head. So I drop down that. So this is going to be a continuous function. This is going to be the simplest case. So I'm going to get an interval, but you can think about it being more complicated if, if F, F was discontinuous. Um, so this is negative radical A, and this one is negative radical B. And this will be an open interval because it's a dashed line and the function's continuous. But again, weird things, weird things could happen if, if I made f discontinuous. And that's radical b. So the pre-image of a, b is negative radical b, negative radical b, negative radical a, union, Radical A, radical B. So is this is your first, if it's your first time seeing this, um, try to think of some other examples or rewatch this section because again, this is this intuition is sort of essential for, for Lebesgue integration. Um, so now I'd like to go. I'd like to go through uh, one property here. So properties one, two, and three are true. So if I give you x, y, x and y, f from x to y, and a and b contained in the in the um, codomain, then the pre-image commutes with union, is how you state this, or how one can state it. So if I give you A union B, well, all I, I really only have to consider the pre-image under A first, because that's simpler, and then I can just union it with the pre-image of B, because that's simpler. Similarly with uh, complementation and intersection. So I'll just show union. The proofs of the other ones are, are pretty similar. So this one you can, this one's kind of nice because it's just set manipulations. So what does that mean for X to be in the pre-image of A union B? Well, by definition, that tells me that X is in A union B. Well, so this is definition of pre-image. And this is just definition of union. All right, it's either in A, f of x is either in A or B. And that's definition of pre-image. So notice that because I'm putting definitions here, they're, they're all ifs and only ifs. So I'm essentially unraveling definitions. That's why I don't have to do subset, subset as the proof outline. And my logic will still be um, solid here. And so this is definition of union. And this one, two, and three are sort of standard. They're left to exercises for the readers. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, um, see if you can follow this train of logic if that was a bit too fast. Because it's good to work that yourself. You know, you'll you'll learn it better if you do it yourself than, than if I do it. Similarly for two and three. Definitely go through those. See if you can derive that logic. Same. It's very similar. You can just do if and only if super short proof. And so now I'd like to go. Well, it looks like I've already drawn it. So now let's do a primer for for our next video here on actual Lebesgue integration. How, how are pre-images related to Lebesgue integration? Oh, sorry, I'm actually at the bottom of my screen. How close to the bottom is this? Okay, so uh, f of x is zero if x 
is irrational. Let's stay on the interval of 0 to 1. 1 if x is... Uh, well, let's just stay on the real line. Uh, so this is 1 if x is in. So we're considering uh, the whole real line now. Uh, I'll just say otherwise. Well, yeah, Q complement. <clears throat> yeah, because it won't matter because uh, the rationals is still measure zero. Yeah, I'll just redraw the function. Save space. So um, one, zero. So similarly, I've got this super dense cloud of all zero functional values. And then I've got this other dense cloud, but which is actually measure zero. You literally can't draw this because if you zoom in further, it looks exactly the same. It's just as dense. So, um, but this is actually measure zero. So in some sense, they're both dense, but the, the green dot should be denser to some degree. So just remember that weird things happen at infinity. So uh, that's why this is extremely hard to draw. So let's do something similar. Let's look at F inverse of negative epsilon to epsilon for epsilon positive. Uh, let's, let's just stay green. Oh, no, 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 that'll be confusing. Uh, let's go pink. So sorry, sorry if you're red, green, colorblind. I'm not sure how sensitive pink is. So we're gonna do the same thing, negative epsilon to epsilon. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna draw a dashed line. Okay. And again, you can imagine this being filled, right? It's actually a bunch of straight lines that fill this whole thing up. Do I see any green? Yes, I do. And if I add up all the green, all those X's that remain inside this thin sheet, well, that is, uh, or epsilon less than one, zero less than epsilon. Less than. This is uh, the irrationals, okay? Now, the question becomes, did I actually have to take a small interval there? No, I don't, because I have pre-images. A singleton is a measurable set. So I could have actually just, because remember, I'm actually envisioning this as coloring this in with a bunch of straight lines. So if I just go to singleton zero here, make it darker. I'm going to draw this line. Do I see any green? Oh, absolutely. Green stays within that set because now it's a, it's, a it's a solid dashed line and it's literally infinitesimal, infinitesimally thin. It's just a dashed line or a straight line. So this is Q complement. Similarly, the pre-image of the singleton one is the rationals, okay? And the reason why I'm emphasizing that this is literally an infinitesimal slice here, right, it's just a line. I'm not talking about something that has actually has volume like the pink, pink region. I don't want to confuse you, so let's erase that. So the point is, what should this integral be? Well, it should be the height of the function times how many points that take that value of the function, right? Because let's imagine now I'm, I'm looking at x to be e. e is an irrational number, okay? f... Uh, f of x equals 
0 at that point. Similarly, if I take x to be uh, 2, it's less than e. Its value is 1 at that point, right? But I can take an infinitesimal slice, right? That'll give me the area under that specific point. But remember, with Riemann integration, uh, well, what is what is you know uh, what is an infinitesimal slice? Well, it's literally with zero, but then you have infinitely many of them. How do you count that? Well, you can't. Riemann integration relies on the assumption that you're taking smaller and smaller widths of epsilon. Well, let's get rid of it. <laughs> that way; it's not factorial. So epsilon greater than zero. And then you take the limit as they get small. But here, I can literally take the rationals. And by looking at it down this vertical axis, I'm, I'm picking essentially an actually infinitesimal part uh, point here. And then I multiply its functional value, right? Because that's the height, times the measure of the set. And that should be equivalent to the Riemann integral, if the Riemann integral exists, it should give you the area under the curve, even if the Riemann integral doesn't exist. So what our calculations suggest we should do is we compute, so I did rationals in purple here. So so I know that the range of f is ju just these singleton 0 and 1, right? So, uh, which will be actually, so it's what's called a simple function. Its range has a finite number of values. Well, in that case, we, we should know how to integrate it. Intuitively, this should be 0 times the measure. So, if, in fact, if I give you any function Uh, that has a range 0 to 1, this formula will work. The integral over the whole real line of f of x dx equals this. 0 times that, the height of this times the functional value of 1. Okay, so this... Oh, I don't want to run out of space. Let's get closer here. This is 0... So I, for, I forgot to color code this. It's fine. Times the measure of the... Uh, sorry. Let's actually assume that we were on 0 to 1 this whole time. Because that'll be infinite otherwise. But... Yeah, sorry about that. So we were on 0, 1 the whole time. Same, same, same logic. So this is 0 times 1 plus 1 times 0 which is zero. And, and this is sort of a primer. This main idea here is, is you're actually starting along the codomain, pulling back on the domain, and having this super fine grain, literally infinitesimal margin of error that you don't have with Riemann integration. And that is why Lebesgue integration is more general and the Lebesgue integral will, in fact, agree with the Riemann integral when the Riemann integral exists. So I'm excited that we're on Lebesgue integration here. Um, on the next video, we'll, we'll get into, we'll actually define the Lebesgue integral.